Welcome to worship this Pentecost Sunday. Today we celebrate the gift of God's Spirit present in our lives. Thanks be to His amazing grace. Even after the resurrection, when the disciples were weighed down with worry, Jesus assured them that they were not alone. The Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you everything and remind you of all that I have said to you. And even after the resurrection, when the disciples were burdened by their fears, Jesus calmed their troubled hearts and said, do not let your hearts be troubled, nor let them be afraid. Even after the resurrection, when we struggle with our faith, Jesus blesses us with comfort and hope. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Especially after the resurrection, when our souls are dry and barren, the Holy Spirit blows through our lives, bringing us new life. Alleluia. Sing a 
Let us pray our prayer of praise and confession. Lord, we approach you today with hearts weighed down with uncertainty, conflict, and good intentions. Yet every day we fall short of your will for selfless love. We admit that when life feels complicated, difficult, or frustrating, we allow our hearts to harden. We speak without empathy, we act without thought, we move to preserve ourselves without consideration of the whole picture. Lord, this is our nature. Help us to turn to you and not to our own understanding. Help us to share your gospel in this world through the ways of your love. Forgive us, Lord, for forgetting or ignoring the spirit of goodness you have placed within us. Forgive us for the things we have done that hurt you, that hurt others or ourselves, and dishonor the vision of your great kingdom. Lord, help us to be better. We come to you in silent reflection now so that we might listen for your presence and your guidance. In Christ, amen. Hear and know the good news that no one but God stands to judge us and God acts with grace, mercy, and love that is beyond our understanding. Thanks be to God. Friends, let us pray. Lord, take our minds and think through them. Take our lips and speak through them. And take our hearts and set them on fire. Amen. Our reading today comes from Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 13. Listen now for the word of the Lord. When the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place, and suddenly from heaven there came a sound like a rush of a violent wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. Divided tongues as a fire appeared among them, and a tongue rested on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages as the Spirit had given them the ability. Now, there were devout Jews from every nation under heaven living in Jerusalem. And at this sound, the crowd gathered and was bewildered because each of them heard speaking in their native language. Amazed and astonished, they asked, Are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear each of us in our own native language? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt, and parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs. In our own languages, we hear them speaking about God's deeds of power. All were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, What does this mean? But others sneered and said, They are filled with new wine. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So here we are, 50 days after Passover and the Last Supper, 40 some days after Christ's death and resurrection, and about one week after Jesus ascended. Now before he left them, Jesus promised them an advocate so that they would never need to be alone on their ministry journeys ahead. And so they waited for the promised advocate who would come and empower them for a charge of ministry that Christ gave to them. The way would indeed be challenging in this broken world. Temptations to return to their former lives would have been strong. Even now, they say that these men are drunk and foolish and delusional even. They would need all the help that they could get for the job that lay ahead to open the eyes of God's children to gospel truth. Truly, these were the first church. They were open, ready to be transformed, and prepared 
for a life constantly on the move. And then, whoosh, the advocate arrives in a roar of wind and fire. The power of its influence must have been absolutely unmistakable. Fire has been used as a religious symbol for several thousands of years to point to moments of significant transformation and divine presence. Whether a force of mighty destruction or a piece of comfort and light in darkness, much like the nature of God, fire has us transfixed, drawing us in to wonder at its beauty and at its power. It is a divine fire the great I am that calls Moses from the brush, a blaze, yet light did not consume it, gentle, yet mighty, never harming the bush, nor threatening Moses, but calling him in, drawing him in to hear the calling on his life and to equip him for the purposes that he would soon discover. In the book of Daniel, Nebuchadnezzar throws Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego into a fiery blaze, and yet they do not burn, and God is seen standing there with them. Isaiah's lips were kissed with the fiery coal to give him God's words to do his ministry. And Jeremiah says God's word within him was like a burning fire within every bone in his body. In Acts chapter 1, Jesus tells the disciples to wait and be baptized in the Holy Spirit and by fire, just as John had baptized Jesus. Jesus' baptism was the mark of the beginning of his ministry in many ways. See, today, Pentecost marks the beginning of the ministry of the disciples, that they may go out and give the word to the world. Some might say today is the birthday of the church. In other years, other churches might celebrate with singing and cake and fellowship. And preachers remind their congregations today of the gift of the church. With fire and spirit, with tongues of every land, the church was born. But what is the church exactly? There's a current topic for you. <laughs> The church. It is said churches are essential. Open the churches. We must have church. You know, this, this rhetoric, open the churches, this misunderstanding of the church, it, it puts a chill through my spine. So let me be plainfully clear, if I may. A church cannot close. A building can a church does not die. It lives on in a new way as promised in Christ's resurrection. A church, a true church, is spirit-led, not people-driven. And that is a very, very fine line that we walk. I want you to take a look at this beautiful stained glass. It is right here in this sanctuary this is a depiction of Pentecost, the birth of the church. And here we see the disciples, believers, each with fire of the Spirit above their heads. Now I want you to notice something as you look at this with me. Where are the disciples looking? They're not looking into mirrors. They're not looking at each other. Where are they gazing? They don't look to Caesar and they don't look to popes or celebrities. They're either looking down in deep prayer or they're looking up, seeking the divine, unwavering in their gaze. They are completely consumed by the Spirit. They're ready to hear and know the mission that God has for each of them. They're relying not on their own understanding, no. So now they speak in tongues that, that they previously never understood, and they must rely on the guidance of the advocate, the Spirit. Church is what happens when the Spirit is alive in us. So that begs the question, who is this Spirit? 
What is this spirit? The spirit is the one and only thing that you can never be robbed or cheated of. The spirit is a gift given freely from God to you. And as evidenced in this text, it is given to all peoples of every land. It is mighty, but not forcefully invasive. The disciples, they were waiting for the spirit. They were open and welcoming to its influence in their lives. It must be invited to be wielded in this life. The spirit is God in us. Some call her wisdom. Others may know her as grace or as an aura. Some may even know her as the force. She is mighty. She is strong, yet she is love and she is tenderness too. So who does that make us? Well, to state the obvious, we are incredibly complex beings stuck in a web within ourselves, within our families, within our societies, and within our world. We are both loving and driven by unloving desires. We are beautiful and we are sinful. We are hopeful and yet we are devastating. We are God's children. And truly, we we are children living and moving in a world that we do not understand. And in turn, much of the world, including the faithful, including you and I, we do not understand faith itself. And we all act out and we try to be good but always we need a loving hand to help us find our way. Life is complicated and it is messy. It's filled with choices and the consequences of those choices. Sometimes when I have trouble categorizing these things, I think about life like one of those 1980s choose your own adventure books. We begin reading the pages of the book and we get invested into the characters and the situations which surround them. And we really start to care. And then we get to a page with two or more choices labeled A, B, C, and so on. And we are invited to choose one of those choices. And depending on what we choose, we then jump ahead to that page number and continue the story. And sometimes these choices are very difficult. And later the story twists in unimaginable ways and we struggle to understand it. When we come to these choice moments in life. How do we know what is right and what is wrong? How do we know what is just and what is gracious? Will it be okay? And and we grow anxious and sometimes we get careless and we get reckless even. It is in these moments in life that as Christians, we are called to contemplate the path forward in a certain way. We must ask ourselves three questions before we make any choice in life. How does this serve God? How does this serve others? And how does this choice serve myself? These questions could be called a recipe for righteousness. When asked in exactly that order, God, others, and self, we can then proceed as faithful people. It's hardly ever simple, is it? It's hardly ever black and white. Sometimes what serves God does not serve ourselves or our desires. And that is the continuous battle of the righteous and of the faithful soul. It is written in our Presbyterian polity that we cannot look at another person and determine whether the spirit is actively working in them and whether or not they are chosen but we will know our own hearts. So how do we know? How do we know if we are of that number? Well, to even ask this question gives us an answer, doesn't it? But to live up to that title, to that divine election, that is the true challenge. If we desire to know whether we have acted in the spirit of God or in the spirit of ourselves, Let us first examine the things that we are most passionate about, the things that animate us, that anger us, that excite us. What are they? 
And how do they affect us? Why do they affect us in the way that they do? And how do we choose to act and react? How does this serve God? And, and how does my reaction serve others? And how does all of this serve myself? If we struggle to justify the answer to the first question, then we are most certainly self-led and closed off to the guidance of the Spirit who struggles within us to keep aflame. The Spirit is our advocate, not our adversary. To do the right thing, the loving thing, the caring thing, may not always be the most convenient thing. And not every choice is easy. Jesus did a lot of things in his life that did not serve to elevate himself. But he did serve God. Are we serving God with each choice that we make? There was a comic that I saw not long ago, and I'll put it here for you all. Jesus had just ascended, leaving the disciples, and they stand together, and one of them says, so what have we learned? And another says, well, pretty much, love God and love your neighbor. And they all agreed that this was simple. And then we see some figures in the distance approaching, a priest, a pope, a rabbi, and the disciples say, uh-oh, here come the theologians. <laughs> you know, if, if we ever want to confuse ourselves or complicate a simple demand of Christ to love one another, simply read a theology book. <laughs> Each one will give us something completely different. And this is why people who claim to be Christian hold signs of hate. This is why people who claim to be faithful hold others as lesser than themselves. This is why the word Christian tastes so bad in the mouths of so many. That comic could easily be followed up by another one that I saw. Jesus is talking to the faithful and he says, the difference between me and you, is that you use scripture to determine what love means, and I use love to determine what scripture means. Again, how do we serve God? God's number one mission is love. Now, I promised to be plain. This country is a mess. We're tired, we're stressed out, and we're fighting. Masks, hydroxychloroquine, money versus safety, life versus livelihood, church safety versus church togetherness. Church. Temptations of self-interest and advancement are all the more powerful now. And honestly, the older that I grow, the more I look around and I see thoughtlessness in people. I see people say things that hurt others out of selfishness and anger. And I see people hold passions that don't serve God. And they do it in the name of God. In vain. I see people pointing fingers and yelling and crying and screaming and blaming. All things that we teach our children not to do. And we do them. Myself included. We have become worse than toddlers in a meltdown. No wonder we are called children of God. Yet, as children, somewhere in our base coding, our fundamental building blocks is a little light of the spirit, of love and of hope and of selfless care. In that way, little children are better than we are. They see the beauty through the ugliness, and they choose to pursue it more often than not. So perhaps it's time for us to shut our mouths, and retract our fingers, and actually use these ears that God gave us to listen to him with 
The Spirit is screaming at us. And so many of us have put her on mute. Now, if you are feeling uncomfortable right now, good. Because she, she is banging on the sides of your heart with her fists. So are you going to let her out of the prison within you? Or are you going to take the easy road and suppress her while getting what you want? How can we serve God? How can we serve others? And how do these things serve myself? Once again, the church is not the building. It never was. The church lives inside people who listen to the Spirit, who act with love first and foremost. A love of God, a love of others, and a love of self. So where have we set our eyes, if not on God? Every day is a new day, every tick of the clock a new second. Let us be open to transformation. The church was never meant to sit still. It was never meant to be confined to a man-made building. It was meant to go out there into this big, messy world beyond itself. And we were meant to touch others with the light of God's love. The true church is spirit-led, and it's moving in a new yet ancient fashion. So which way will we go? Whose spirit will we follow? Who will we serve? The gods of today or the God of no end? The spirit is your advocate, your coach, your guide, and your mentor. And the spirit is God within you. So friends, let us choose this day, this moment, to be born anew in God and to stand before him and open our hearts to the Spirit, that we might be the one true church, not made of brick and mortar and wood, but of flesh and bone and love. Amen. Let us pray. Divine fire, O Holy Spirit of God, make your home within us that we may move amid the ebbs and flows of your grace. Reveal to us the passion buried within for love, kindness, beauty, and gratitude, bringing these to life for your holy purposes. As society moves at hyperspeed, O oh God, the news changing by the minute, may we keep pace as the faithful, helping to mend the brokenness we feel and see and know. Between all the choices that lie before us, help us to discern rightly by your will to serve you boldly and generously for others, before serving ourselves. May we be agents of your divine peace, your transforming love, and your irresistible grace. We pray for those emerging through the early years and early decades of life who will be influenced by this time. Give them yet a hopeful spirit for the future to never stop learning and a cheerful spirit to enjoy the ordinary, which testifies to the extraordinary. We give thanks today for those you have received unto yourself beyond death, for those who feel their absence, and for those who comforted them in their final hours. We pray for the exhausted health care worker, the tired store worker, the weary delivery person, and the conflicted politicians. We pray for those who feel anxiety, stress, loneliness, hardship, depression, and hopelessness. 
Bring them your peace, comfort, strength, and wisdom. We pray for the church, the people who hold you in their hearts and move in step with your spirit in this dance of life. In a confusing time with many challenges and struggles, may we stand together, though physically apart, and persevere in faith through the strangeness of this time. God, we ask that you hear all our prayers this day and hear us now praying as Jesus taught. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. and serve with gladness wherever God's Spirit in Jesus Christ draws near and leads, blesses and makes life new in this hour and in this day. May this be your life and reality in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen.